Our, our next panel on international criminal enforcement, and for me, this is one of the most stressful parts of the week, is introducing my friend and colleague, Joe Whitley, because I always uh, seem to forget about one of his many positions, and, uh, the DOJ, and, and he has a way of reminding me, so I'm going to do <laughs> to get it covered. You know, Joe really needs no introduction, but um, we're, we're very happy to have Joe moderating this panel. And Joe has had a, a very uh, successful career, both in the government and outside the government. Um, as you probably know, Joe served as the acting associate uh, attorney general. He was the first general counsel for the Department of Homeland Security. Joe is the U.S. attorney in both the Middle District of Georgia and the Northern District of Georgia. Joe also served as an assistant district attorney in Columbus in the Chattahoochee Judicial Circuit. Okay. Is that, I guess, <laughs> that's the best introduction and I've so, ever had. And Joe, so. Joe also serves as the chair of the government investigations uh, group at Baker Donaldson, and, and as you know, is very involved with the ABA and is the founder of this program. And so, thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Um, I think I may be alive here with this one. Is, is this coming through okay? Uh, thanks very much for the kind introduction. I wanted to uh, get us started with our panel, but reminder that our lunch will be right after this uh, panel is over with, and that's right down the hallway, going out the doors to the left, and I uh, look forward to seeing everybody at, at lunch. Um, I wanted to say this topic that is on the agenda is, um, uh, something that I thought this, this program might, might use, and it's a little bit of a sampler, if you will, on three different distinct topics, but they're all related, and there is a hypothetical that each of you should have in front of you that's uh, going to be useful to look at during the course of this presentation. Um, it's, the title of our program is Through the Looking Glass, A Glimpse at International Criminal Enforcement in 2019, and we're going to be looking at uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, Export Control, and extradition, all of those three really work together, and uh, they do matter to practitioners uh, from large cities and small cities. And I'm going to introduce now our panel, and to my immediate left is uh, Chuck DeRoss, uh, who's co-chair of the Mor uh, Morrison Foster uh, White Collar Defense Practice Group, and uh, he spent uh, a couple of decades uh, in the Department of Justice uh, handling uh, critical matters there. Uh, he was deputy chief of the fraud section, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Unit uh, in the Department of Justice and Maine Justice in Washington. Uh, he's been in other positions in private practice, uh, but earlier in his career he was an assistant United States Attorney in the Southern District of Florida. Um, all throughout, though, uh, he's been known as Mr. FCPA. He is the the guy to go to uh, when it comes to Foreign Corrupt Practices Act matters. Uh, I've been on the other side of Chuck uh, and when he was in the criminal division, by uh, begging for mercy for one of my clients, um, and uh, who was outstripping the bounds of uh, propriety uh, in another country, uh, being creative about how he was getting business here in the United States. And uh, long story, I uh, had a pretty good ending for my client. He didn't go to prison. Uh, but he did uh, have to pay a price uh, for his conduct. So uh, throughout all of that, uh, Chuck was uh, fair uh, to me and uh, the client, and I appreciated that. Chuck, I'll always appreciate that. Chuck is a Southerner uh, growing up in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and uh, went to the University of Michigan School of Law, but he is married to uh, a woman from Charleston, South Carolina. Next to Chuck is Alan Enslin, who is my colleague at Baker Donaldson. Uh, Chuck, uh, Alan has offices in both our Washington and, uh, and, and Birmingham offices. He is chair of our International Trade and Security Group. Uh, he represents clients in international trade matters, national security matters. Uh, he's conversant in CFIUS. Uh, he does a good, great bit of work in export control matters. Uh, he has helped me. Uh, and Brett Schweitzer, who's here somewhere, uh, in a very difficult Iranian sanctions matter. Um, he had a distinguished career in the U.S. military before uh, his legal career. Uh, he is gra he's a graduate of the University of Alabama School of Law, but he is a big Auburn fan. Um, <laughs> next to, uh, next to uh, Alan, to, her, to his left, is Nina Marino. 
uh, who I'm delighted to see with us from uh, Beverly Hills, California, where our law firm Kaplan and Marino is situated. Uh, she has a national practice that focuses on white collar matters, complex litigation in both federal and state courts. Most importantly for today's program, uh, she handles uh, a great deal of matters involving international extradition and many other related white collar crime areas. Uh, Nina is a very distinguished attorney who has uh, achieved a lot of prominence in the American Bar Association through her leadership. Uh, she's a key developer of the United States uh, UK International Crime Seminar that's coming up in London October 14th and 15th, 2019. So I encourage those of you who might be there in London at that time to join in or travel to London. It's a great program. Uh, Nina is the Continuing Legal Education Director for the Criminal Justice Section of the ABA. And she's a graduate of the Laverne School of Law in California. What I wanted to do now uh, is talk a little bit about the hypothetical. So if you should have this sheet in front of you, um, we're gonna talk about the hypothetical because it's kind of woven into the presentations that you'll hear from our three panelists. Uh, so we have something that's a little bit, as in most good fiction, um, fictional narratives, this one is based on a, a real case uh, that I was involved in, but the names and uh, locations and certain things have been changed to protect the guilty. But um, so a publicly traded uh, Acme Oil Company uh, is located in Savannah, Georgia, as a parent company in the UAE. It has foreign ownership um, uh, ultimately, but the president and owner is a, a person named Asimov and the vice president is uh, Heinrich Hertz, a German. The plant is owned by several Russian companies, uh, kind of like a Russian doll. The companies manufacture oil for cars and highly refined oil for special uses to include jet engines. And the plant's significant to the Savannah economy because it employs uh, 200 people. Both Hertz and Asimov are resident aliens in the United States working under work permits, and they both have authority over sizable amounts of funds related to the operation of Agme in the United States and Savannah to include uh, their own personal bank accounts in the United States. Um, and as usual, uh, disgruntled employees are at the center of these things because uh, the government hears about them through those employees. The employees are discontented and underpaid. Uh, the plant manager is, uh, has a great name. He's an American citizen named Lo Local Boy. Uh, Local Boy departs amid rumors that uh, the oil is somehow making its way to Iran through the UAE. Agents for the parent company in the UAE are obtaining licenses and work permits for Acme Oil. Under the table, print payments are made to UAE ministry officials uh, to obtain approval to ship oil to Iran. Uh, we, as in the, pre the previous uh, panel, uh, we heard it's better to be raided than get a subpoena, surprisingly. Uh, so the plant in Savannah is raided, uh, all their documents and information seized. Uh, the plant manager is questioned by Treasury, the FBI, and the U.S. Department of Commerce. And that's usually the team you see in these types of cases. Um, in the meantime, Hertz is uh, happily in Frankfurt and Asimov is in Moscow meeting with the company owners. Uh, on the reverse side of the hypothetical, we have some questions which we'll save for later. But what I ask each of the panelists to do now is kind of walk through their each individual, their disciplines, uh, with some reference maybe from time to time, possibly to the hypothetical. But more importantly, I wanted you to hear the latest uh, information and news on the FCPA, which is in constant change, even though it was enacted in 1977, they really didn't come into great use until recent decades. And then after that, I've asked Alan to talk about uh, export controls. And the following on the heels of that, uh, we'll talk about extradition with Nina. So let me start with you, Chuck. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Obviously, I gave uh, Joe's client a good deal. That's how I got invited to this conference. <laughs> Just he didn't go into those level of details. But uh, in any event. Um, first, I want to thank Joe for inviting me. Um, this is a, a, a fantastic conference. I've not been able to make it before, but hopefully, uh, as Joe uh, mentioned earlier this morning, I will become a recidivist. All right. Uh, okay. So let me kind of move uh, to um, the FCPA. So I'm going to try to do 
an intense short course on both FCPA nuts and bolts, uh, as well as recent enforcement activity. Let me just sort of gauge the, the room. How many people familiar with the FCPA? Oh, pretty good, okay. By the way, I was a prosecutor in Miami for five years. I'd never even heard of it uh, until I came to Maine Justice uh, in 2006. So you guys are way ahead of where I was. Um, uh, so look, the, the FCPA in a nutshell basically is two very different provisions of the law smushed together. And that is the product of sort of the history of, of the, the statute uh, coming online, which was in the 1970s, there were sort of a series of different problems that occurred. Um, one was the Watergate uh, Commission that looked into Nixon's uh, campaign uh, creep. Uh, and uh, and they, they found that there were a number of offshore accounts that were being used to funnel money to the president's campaign. Uh, and the SEC was concerned um, about uh, this as a uh, investor issue because they were off the books accounts. Uh, and, uh, and offshore accounts that were not sort of part of the information that investors were getting, so the SEC was concerned about that. Uh, that ultimately becomes the accounting provisions, which requires accurate books and records and effective internal accounting controls. Around the same time in the 1970s, there was actually a separate issue, which was a number of governments were being toppled because of corruption scandals, including major allies of the United States. Japan, Netherlands, Italy, et cetera. And suddenly uh, what was at the core of those uh, corruption scandals were US defense contractors uh, paying bribes in order to sell uh, military equipment. And so it was really viewed as a diplomatic issue. Uh, a real concern in the Cold War uh, that we had basically defense contractors uh, paying bribes to sell certain uh, equipment. And so they started looking into how many other companies were doing this. Turns out more than 300 during the amnesty period sort of confessed to doing it. And ultimately the government decided, well, we should prohibit that. Uh, and so that became the anti-bribery provisions. That's your history of the FCPA in a nutshell. So now you have these two very different provisions. So the FCPA, what everyone in this room thinks of when you think of the FCPA, are the anti-bribery provisions, and that's which, what makes it illegal for U.S. citizens, U.S. companies, including those publicly traded, foreign companies that trade on a U.S. exchange, and later, through amendments, foreign nationals and foreign non-publicly traded companies uh, that take acts while in the territory of the United States are also covered, and it prohibits the payment of bribes, uh, things of value, uh, to foreign officials, which the question is like, who's a foreign official? But to foreign officials in order to obtain and retain business. So just to give you a quick uh, example, you get pulled over in Mexico uh, for speeding and you give you know 200 pesos to the cop to let you go. It's a bribe to a foreign official in Mexico. Uh, is it a violation of the FCPA? No, uh, because the FCPA was designed to prohibit bribes to obtain or retain business. So it may be a bribe in Mexico, but it's not a violation of the FCPA. There has to be an obtain or retaining business component to it. And incidentally, what does that mean? It's very broad, right? So there, there was a case, United States versus rice a number of years ago, uh, where some guys who were selling rice in Haiti were paying bribes uh, to avoid t uh, taxes and tariffs on the rice. They were basically paying people to make sure that the weight didn't look the way it was supposed to. Uh, they got charged with FCPA violations, and they said, it wasn't to obtain or retain business, we were basically just paying to avoid taxes. Um, and the Fifth Circuit interpreting the law said, no, 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 no. By reducing the taxes, you were able to reduce the price of your rice, which made you more competitive against your competitors, and therefore you were in fact doing it to obtain business. Otherwise, why would you be doing it? Uh, and so obtain or retain, very broad. Foreign, foreign official, um, so everybody knows foreign officials, judges, pr presidents, prime ministers, ministers, you know, all those folks, customs uh, um, uh, officials, but the, the folks that work at state-owned entities, for the most part, we don't have time to get into all those details, will often qualify as foreign officials as far as DOJ or SEC is concerned. So think PETAVESA or PEMEX, well, I guess probably is part of it, um, uh, Petro-Ecuador, um, you know, uh, uh, some state-owned airlines, uh, uh, telecommunications companies, those kinds of things that are state-owned, operated, and run. Very important case, United States versus Eskenazi, uh, which interprets that. We don't have time to get into all that, but I'll just mention, you know, if you're wondering what that means uh, and what that definition is, you'll see it. And then uh, the accounting provisions. This is the sneaky shit. I'm just like, if you guys are just wondering, like everybody talks about uh, you know, the bribery piece. If your client is publicly traded 
What you care about is that thing because it's the books and records and internal controls. And the truth is, and I hope nobody from the SEC is in the room, the SEC has long like left the, you know, the, the moorings of what the statute actually means, uh, which you, know, that you need to you know, um, uh, set up and maintain, devise, maintain a system of effective internal accounting controls. What the SEC has now interpreted that today to mean is if there's anything that's ever gone wrong in your business period, like you have not uh, devised and maintained an effective accounting control. It's ridiculous, but that is the current status. I'm just telling you the practical shit. All right, I'm moving quickly. I'm moving quickly. Hopefully everybody's following me. Okay, so the one question that I got once uh, Trump took office was, is the FCPA dead? And I think that that is a fair question. A lot of people asked Trump, as people may know, on CNBC, while I was still running the FCPA unit, took a big shit on the FCPA unit and said, like, this is like the worst law ever passed. Uh, you know, it's a terrible law, it makes us not competitive. Uh, everybody's bribing, we should be allowed to do that to be competitive. Uh, <laughs> let's get rid of the law. That, that's a, that, that's, I swear to you, it's like a nutshell. It really, it was about that bad. So if anybody has a question or comment during this presentation, uh, feel free to raise your hand. I wanted to add that. Oh yeah, absolutely, so, fire away, fire away. Not, not about the word choice, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep the... That's good. It is to it, yeah. I like it. I like okay. it. All right. It's, it's early. I'm trying to get... It's the FCP. I'm trying to get people excited. Um, so, so there were a lot of questions, legitimate questions by my clients that said, do we need to worry about the FCPA anymore? Is it really going to sort of continue to be uh, enforced as, uh, as rigorously as it has in the past? Well, two years into the Trump administration, or more now, um, the answer is nothing has changed at SEC, at DOJ, the people that enforce those laws are career professionals and they really don't, almost none of it matters really uh, in sort of the, the people that come and go on the top. And, and there's been no effort to um, you know, uh, amend the law, uh, at least not by the administration. Uh, I think, frankly, once people got into office and into place, they suddenly realized um, that the law helps try to level the playing field for US companies. Uh, since most of the top 10 biggest cases are actually non-US companies uh, that have been hit by uh, FCPA enforcement. And so it's sort of a different reason for the same thing. Uh, and so that uh, has continued uh, unabated. So let me give you some numbers just so you sort of have sort of a sense of what's been going on. Um, so, so 2019 uh, has been a busy year. Uh, there have been, uh, I think, is it, I'm trying to read these things from here. Uh, I think eight uh, uh, enforcement actions by SEC, five by DOJ, uh, sort of a variety of different industries. Um, the truth is people ask like, where's DOJ going next or where SEC is going next? It's entirely opportunistic. It's like what they read in the Wall Street Journal, what companies come in and tell them something. If the FBI brings a case in, they're not necessarily targeting a particular industry. SEC sometimes does that, but for the most part, DOJ does not. Um, geographic diversity, uh, the case is really um, are all over the place. Uh, more recently focused on uh, Latin America, particularly with Brazil and Equ uh, Ecuador um, and PDVSA in, in Venezuela. Uh, so with the Petrobras case and the like, there's been a lot of focus on, on Latin America. That's a bit of a change. Um, China has been, for the last couple of years, the, the 800 pound gorilla in the room and the vast majority of the cases in the last number of years, um, percentage wise, has actually uh, been, been China and something people should be cautioning any of your clients that maybe, even if they're a small business in the US, uh, if they're working in China, it's a reason for them to be concerned and focused on, on the FCPA. Um, very significant penalties. We're talking about billions of dollars. Last year it was billions of dollars. So again, if people are looking for the Trump effect, it really doesn't exist. Um, accounting provisions, remember what I said before, that's the sneaky stuff. Um, so, uh, I'm trying to clean up my act. Um, so, the 100% uh, the of the SEC's cases have included accounting charges, and in many instances, and I forget, I can't really read the number. What is the number? 60, what is it? Anyway, uh, two thirds or so of their cases so far are accounting uh, provision cases that are standalone accounting, which is, there's no bribery piece to it, it's only accounting. And, and, uh, and there's you know, a significant, you know, uh, there's less uh, with DOJ in terms of that, but in many years, 100% of the SEC's FCPA cases are accounting cases. You wouldn't know that if you read the press release, you wouldn't know it if you read in the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal, but it's the accounting stuff. It's the internal controls and the books and records that the clients get uh, caught up on, in part because um, jurisdiction, we can talk about that in the context of the hypothetical. Jurisdiction um, it was often still requires a US nexus, 
people think the FCP can reach everything. That's not entirely true. Um, but the accounting provisions don't have a wire requirement. They don't require a U.S. nexus. If you want access to a U.S. capital market, uh, you're subject to jurisdiction uh, globally. And that's why you end up seeing this. It solves a lot of the jurisdictional issues. And frankly, the SEC often can't prove the shit. And so what they end up doing is they're just like, well, it's an accounting issue. Uh, and so that's kind of how it works out. I'm sorry, I threw in another. I'm sorry. This is four. Uh, so shit's not that bad a word. Um, Five. So, so uh, individual enforcement. Individual enforcement at DOJ uh, has really uh, ramped up in the last few years. Uh, and so a number of individuals have been uh, charged. Uh, it's a good thing um, in the sense of uh, it has the opportunity to create case law, which because it was a sleepy backwater for so many years and many of the cases are non uh, sort of um, contested matters, they're uh, guilty pleas, non-prosecution agreements or deferred prosecution agreements. It's really kind of what the US government says it is. Uh, and so these cases will ultimately do that. There was uh, one trial earlier this year involving um, bribes in Haiti uh, in Boston. Uh, both individuals were convicted. Uh, the DOJ has sort of quietly uh, had a number of trial victories over the last few years. Uh, and they actually have seven pending trials coming up uh, in the next six months or so. Uh, so it's gonna be a very active calendar assuming those cases end up going to trial. Um, the, the one that I would, uh, I would tell you to watch most closely is Hoskins. United States versus Hoskins, it resulted in a very controversial decision depending on which side you sit on um, uh, concerning the applicability of um, essentially being able to charge somebody who is a foreign national uh, with conspiring uh, with a U.S. citizen uh, and be able to charge them with a conspiracy charge. Uh, ultimately, the district court in, in Connecticut said, no, you could not do that based on the Gabbardi principle, saying that Congress intended for foreign nationals not to be able to be charged in certain circumstances. Uh, and the Second Circuit affirmed that decision. Uh, it's gonna have a massive and will continue to have a massive impact uh, with DOJ going forward. That trial is set for October and one to watch. Um, okay, so a lot of people go into trial. A lot of guilty pleas. I mean, 15 individuals uh, announced publicly so far that they've been charged. Uh, last year, I think it was 20, 35 individuals were charged. And that's a very, very, very active uh, enforcement uh, program. Uh, so a couple of the very quick high takeaways. Um, pursuit of individuals, as I was just saying. Incidentally, I want to make sure I highlighted this. So Cognizant, which is a uh, consulting company, technology uh, related company, um, not only did Cognizant resolve something with the SEC, DOJ declined it because of cooperation, but the president and the chief legal officer, so pause there, and the chief legal officer were charged criminally by DOJ uh, for essentially approving um, bribes paid in India. Uh, that's a pretty, you know, aggressive uh, approach by DOJ, and we'll see. I, that's one to follow as well. Um, ascendance of DPA, so we don't have time to get into deferred prosecution agreements here. Uh, people could debate those for a long time. But you know what? Other countries have looked around and said, we want that. Uh, so uh, first, uh, the UK got involved. France now has a DPA. Canada's working on a DPA. Singapore's working on a DPA. Uh, Brazil's got leniency agreements. Um, they like it because it sort of it allows them to resolve the cases quickly and get the money and create essentially a um, an, an alternative to ju a U.S. enforcement. So if you're a French company, uh, France wants that money kept in a French treasury. Um, okay. Uh, U.S. Pol uh, enforcement policy updates, no piling on, uh, some guidance. International legislation is, is pending in a number of places. Lots of world leaders under scrutiny. Massive uh, sort of geographic diversity, we'll talk about that in just one moment. Uh, and declinations without disgorgement. Um, this is, we don't have time to get into all of that, but like DOJ is now declining matters without disgorgement and they're publicly announcing them. That has a huge impact and we'll talk about it during the hypothetical of do you wanna go voluntarily disclose and tell DOJ something they don't know and just hope they're gonna do the right thing. The reward right now for doing the right thing and getting an A plus for your compliance program and, and coming in and voluntarily disclosing is you get publicly tattooed on DOJ's website for the rest of, uh, the, rest of the company's life. So think about that. Um, Sharing, uh, when we talk about international uh, cooperation and enforcement, uh, a number of the cases in the past few years have really divided up um, the, 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 uh, the penalties. And so it's not just the US getting money anymore, it's lots and lots and lots of other company, uh, countries also getting the money. Uh, and then geographic diversity. So in 2004, in 2004, China, uh, cases involving China 
uh, for FCP enforcement by 2004 was exactly zero. So 15 years ago, it was zero. Now it's number one by a large margin and it will continue. Uh, so again, if you have clients that do business in China, that I would go after this conference, I would go out and say, you know, how is your compliance program doing? Do you have any issues there? Uh, China is the number one biggest place and it will continue for a very long time. It's not because the Chinese are more corrupt. It's because, um, because of the Chinese structure, almost every company is a state-owned entity, or at least like 400,000 of them are. Uh, and so there are lots of foreign officials running around there that don't exist in other kinds of uh, economic markets. Um, and everyone wants to do business there, not just uh, sort of build there or manufacture there. They want to sell there, and that's a, a challenge. Okay, that's me. Okay, so uh, that was uh, 15 minutes, and I told Chuck the hook would come out at 15. So a great job. Great job. A few less except swear for, words. Except for the like 14. five times, I think, but maybe we'll hear it more. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep moving. If you have questions, keep them in mind, and we'll uh, get, get to uh, Alan now on export control. All right. Okay. I doubt seriously I can make export controls and economic sanctions as entertaining as Chuck just made the FCPA, but we're going to give it a shot. So, um, Similar question, by a show of hands, how many of you deal with or have dealt with export controls, economic sanctions, uh, you, know, you know, work in that space? Okay, good. Well, uh, and again, with the limited time, which I'm gonna put myself on the clock here, uh, wanna cover a few things that are, uh, there, there are a lot of things going on, obviously. And I would say, uh, if, if there's, there's one takeaway, it's that first uh, bullet set right there. Uh, one of the most key things happening right now is uh, uh, Bureau of Industry and Security is leading an effort to try to determine uh, new export controls on emerging technologies. And we're about to see uh, advance notice of proposed rulemaking for foundational technologies as well. And this is going to have a, a groundbreaking or, a, you know, I would say a, a ground shattering effect on some companies, probably all universities. But it's going to put an, another layer of controls in place in many cases that's going to kind of go against the concept of export control reform that's been going on for the last decade, which has been designed to lower controls. So the reason for that is uh, the Export Control Reform Act, uh, the statute that was, uh, that was uh, passed in uh, summer of 2018, had mandated that BIS determine uh, export controls and emerging technologies. And this really dovetails with the issue um, from the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act, which we'll call FIRMA, um, the, 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 the crux of it is the technology transfer concerns. And I would argue that uh, even though a lot of my day these days has to do with tariffs and the import relief and things like that, that all is going to be negotiated and settled and, and resolved. This part is gonna remain. So to the extent you're dealing with export controls, uh, this is gonna have that lasting effect. It's motivated by China, but it's globally applicable. So uh, it, it's, it's kind of a new game. And so the idea is that as BIS just put it at their conference uh, a couple of months ago, uh, you know, because there's a concern that in the future, the US is going to increasingly either lose its uh, competitive edge in certain technological areas or may not have it to begin with and, and wants to you know, stem the tide of proliferation, that the focus of controls is gonna move more from what they can buy to what they can develop, what they can make. So that's why you're seeing more of a focus on developmental aspects of things and export controls. And so, um, as I said, it's closely tied to the changes in the CFIUS process, uh, which if you're not familiar with that, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, chaired by Treasury, 15 interagency seats, uh, to review foreign direct investment in the United States. Um, and so that, that's a whole nother can of worms that I, I, I won't open, but it's a, uh, you know, there, there's a new uh, process with CFIUS that now calls for situations that may have a mandatory CFIUS declaration filing as opposed to being a pure uh, notice uh, voluntary process as before. And one of the critical components of that process is critical technologies. So what is a critical technology? Well when they rolled out the program, they hadn't quite defined everything yet. So that's what this process of determining emerging technologies is still all about. So um, what, what are they looking at? 14 categories. Uh, if you or your clients are doing anything in the areas of, 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 of advancing tech, uh, you know, you're probably gonna fall in or close to one of these areas. 
uh, there have already been some multilateral controls rolled out that are new, but the next ones to hit the streets within the next few weeks, supposedly, are going to be advanced controls on uh, uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, um, uh, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, um, and robotics. Those are the, the next ones to hit. But you're going to see controls in areas like precision navigation and timing technology, which is key, obviously, to autonomous uh, you know, system development, hypersonics, uh, key to missile defense in, uh, in, in, in those areas. Um, and, and so th those, there's, like I said, 14 of them uh, if, you're, if you're interested in it. But you're going to see new controls in those areas that have not existed before. In, in, in many of those, um, you know, for many of those areas. So, uh, again, it's going to it's a significant emotional event for universities, but also could be, you know, for companies as well. So, um, another significant aspect um, that's going on right now with export controls is the uh, executive order that came out in, in mid May, um, one three eight seven three. If you need something to put you to sleep at night, you can read that. But it's uh, it mandates the uh, that BIS come up with a. Uh, a new regulatory regime to protect uh, information and communications technology and supply chain security. So you can see Huawei type concerns, you know, uh, with this. So you're going to see a new set of regs coming out in uh, probably well, supposedly late next month, um, and uh, th that's going to have also some effects. Um, third bullet there, another significant development is the tightening on uh, Cuba travel uh, really tied to Cuban support to Venezuela and uh, the uh, Maduro regime there. So the upshot of this is this is what killed your plans to go to Havana on your cruise last month, last couple of months. So uh, because of a uh, certain license exception being pulled, uh, we can't, you can't lawfully export that cruise ship anymore. So um, and then again, one thing that's in the news a lot is the, uh, the, the you know, Huawei concerns the charges brought against Huawei and uh, the CFO Meng Wanzhou back in January. And then, you know, uh, Huawei and about 68 affiliates were put on the entity list, which you hear in the press called the black list, can't do business with them. I would argue that it's not a black list. It's, it, it triggers a licensing requirement to do business and there's a presumption of denial. So it's maybe a de facto uh, uh, black list, but you're seeing some relaxation in that as policy decisions are done by the administration as to you know what entities can be dealt with. So um, many more things to cover, but those are the major moving parts. Um, keep us moving forward. Uh, the numbers on enforcement, uh, as the trend you're seeing in all these areas, the numbers are up. So um, you know, significant amount about a about a 40 percent increase roughly in uh, in penalties that uh, BIS is collecting this year. Um, we do have a couple of cases, and we don't have time to get too far into these, but I just want to highlight a couple of cases to give you a flavor of, of, of you know, what is attracting the enforcement attention right now. Uh, one case that probably many of you have heard of is the Access USA shipping, and uh, this is a, a Florida-based uh, you know, shipping company for package consolidation. Um, and essentially, uh, Access USA, uh, or myusa.com, I think is how they were doing business, was uh, is providing a U.S. address was providing a U.S. address to um, to foreign customers essentially. So uh, you know somebody outside the U.S. could you know could, could buy online a product, have it shipped to South Florida, where Access USA would would be the apparent uh, end user, and uh, so therefore you know it's it's obviously a way of uh, of circumventing the export control laws. And um, they get an A for audacity, but that's about where the accolades end for Access USA. Um, the, there, were, there was further uh, actions to change values, reduce values, and to, uh, to do things. I actually put in this quote for all of you prosecutors in the audience or former prosecutors that salivate overseeing something like this in an email. The CTO, the CEO, I know we are willingly and intentionally, full auto in all caps, breaking the law, but, so, if, you know, <laughs> That, I, that's not a red flag, you know, what is. So uh, Upshot, the uh, CEO, um, you know, back at the end of the last year, uh, finally pled guilty to felony smuggling and 166, uh, you know, export control violations, uh, $17 million fine, $7 million suspended, but it still remains the, uh, the largest fine BIS has ever assessed against an individual. Um, the, the company itself was fined uh, when it pled, uh, it was uh, $27 million with, I think, uh, 17 suspended. So 
that uh, that case again. Uh, one of the things to highlight about it too, though, uh, is the it was an unprecedented amount of interagency cooperation from uh, Office of Export Enforcement, Homeland Security Investigations, in, in bringing that one together. So, and uh, also to the extent it's a compliance, it's if you poke the bear, um, the bear is going to react too. So, uh, like I said, that was one that was definitely different in that regard. Um, another one, um, the. Um, U.S. versus she. This one is still uh, ha the sentencing hasn't occurred yet, but uh, in this one, uh, Mr. She was convicted on 18 counts after a six-week trial, and it really surrounds uh, his efforts to 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 access a U.S. company's network, uh, you know, through an accomplice to uh, to obtain design technology for monolithic microwave integrated circuits, which is for all of us non-engineers, that's a semiconductor chip that has missile tech applications and is used in missile guidance systems. So, um, and then uh, that technology is uh, exported to China without a license. And that's, that, that kind of thing is exactly front and center. Well, it's already controlled, but anything in that area that's not is about to be captured by uh, a lot of emerging technologies. So to tie those points together. Um, Mr. Xi, you know, as it turns out was also president of a Chinese technology company that was building an MMIC manufacturing facility in Chengdu that was placed on the entity list in 2014. So there was a bit of a heads up that he might be trying to do something like this. And a uh, pretty stiff penalty that uh, he's uh, facing at, at sentencing, um, which I believe is, uh, is, is still in process. So to leave the export control area and, and uh, hit economic sanctions, uh, this is another area of the trade world that is on steroids. Um, I will say that in, in, in the private practice side, one of the main issues that we see a lot of are the concern about uh, the exposure to uh, U.S. secondary sanctions relating to Iran. And uh, because as you know, once the U.S. pulled out of the JCPOA, um, uh, the, joint, the, the Iran nuclear deal, basically the, the, um, the Europeans uh, and other countries that are still in it, um, because of the agreement, they withdrew their sanctions against Iran in the nuclear area, and that was really all of the sanctions that they had. Whereas we have multiple programs against Iran, withdrawing the nuclear deal was just one of those programs. And so that's why not much really changed for U.S. companies doing business in Iran, but for you know particularly European companies, Chinese companies that have a lot of ties there, it's lawful to go back if they weren't already still there. So that's one of the things that has complicated that, and so um, you know is a big concern. Um, you may be aware that uh, you know not too many months ago, the uh, uh, Ir uh, Iranian uh, Republican Guard Corps, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, was designated as a foreign terrorist organization, and um, that you know that's not surprising in and of itself. But what it has done is significantly increased uh, you know uh, you know exposure for companies operating in the Middle East and in that area because uh, the IRGC's uh, tentacles are pretty broad and involved in a lot of different companies. So um, the, the I've got a note there about OFAC 50% rule compliance. That's something, and we'll talk about a little bit more in the hypothetical, but uh, that is a very difficult, I would argue the most difficult sanctions uh, compliance aspect for companies to deal with. Um, and that is to say that, I mean, we all get it, you can't deal with a specially designated national or somebody who's you know, directly sanctioned, but the OFAC 50% rule says that, right, but if you are owned 50% or more by, in the aggregate, by SDNs, then you are a de facto SDN. So that's the, that's the way, and you could say, well, how would we prove that? Well, that's a good question. You know, that's what makes the due diligence very, very difficult, especially if you're talking about Russia. Um, and, and some of the other, um, you know, some of the other areas of concern. So OFAC 50% rule compliance is, is a bear and some of these steps are just making it more of a bear. So um, there are some significant things that OFAC has also rolled out in the last few months. Um, they rolled out a framework on compliance programs, uh, you know, back in early May, which as we all know is a pretty good signal that you might wanna make sure you have a compliance program addressing sanctions. <clears throat> doesn't, you know, nothing unusual about it really other than the sanctions programs that, that track with a lot of these regulated areas. Um, and then one of the things that's still in the process of being interpreted really, <clears throat> excuse me, is the um, enhanced reporting requirement for rejected transactions that OFAC rolled out in June. Whereas previously there was a requirement for, you know, rejected fund transfers. Now 
the, uh, the, the, the rule is that if you, if you have a, uh, are presented with a potential transaction that you have to reject um, that, that would itself be a sanctions violation, then you're obligated to report that to OFAC. And it's, again, <coughs> they're still working through the bugs as to how that's gonna play out in terms of enforcement, but it's a pretty significant game changer and takes sanctions into an area that, if you're familiar with anti-boycott, it's, it's very much uh, you know, like that area where um, you, you have to report even transactions that you don't do. And then finally, there's been uh, you know, an, an industry-related civil aviation warning on uh, Iran civil aviation and ties to that. Again, this kind of dovetail with the IRGC's foreign, tra uh, foreign terrorist organization designation. And so that is, um, that is an area of, of, of increased concern. And whenever OFAC puts out an industry-specific warning, um, it's, um, it's, it's definitely time to take notice because enforcement is following. So, and again, many of the programs have enhanced restrictions and I would just say more aggressive enforcement as we're about to see from the numbers. Um, you know, you, you may be aware that, you know, most people think about OFAC and sanctions as being country-based programs, but OFAC runs, I think it's 31 programs, at least as of this morning, unless one's happened in the last hour or so, but Nicaragua-related sanctions, I think, are as our last edition, but it's 31 separate programs. So a lot of them destination-based, a lot of them activity-based or list-based. So, um, you know, again, a very active enforcement environment. So in terms of numbers, if, um, if OFAC was a mutual fund, it would have been a really good investment this year, uh, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, they're at a 10-year high, uh, 20 enforcement actions netting just under 1.3 billion, and that was just as of the end of last week. So uh, many more in the hopper. So uh, a, a very significant uptick in that area. So quickly want to cover just a, a couple of um, sanctions cases to give you a flavor of the things they're looking at. The Stanley Black and Decker case back in the spring came out and that was uh, to settle 23 um, violations of um, the Iranian uh, transaction regs. And the upshot here is that Stanley Black and Decker, uh, Decker acquired a Chinese company to operate as its subsidiary in China and you know, did transaction due diligence, un uncovered some unsettling things, put some procedures in place to try to deal with it going forward including compliance certifications and uh, acknowledgements and did some training and everything like that. But the follow-up uh, in, in the government's eyes was a bit lacking because uh, there continued to be shipments uh, to Iran um, you know, through intermediaries um, you know, and, and you know, relating in, uh, in China and the UAE. So the, uh, the, the moral there was that, yeah, putting the certifications in place, doing some training, that's great, but you still got to follow up. So uh, successor liability is alive and well in the sanctions world. It's, you know, that's nothing new about that. But, um, you know, it's just, you know, and nor is there anything new about intermediaries being your lightning rod for enforcement actions. But it's just a, uh, you know, a very active compliance scenario. Anything touching Iran especially if it's uh, Iran via China, is gonna attack, attract a lot of attention from OFAC enforcement right now. Um, and then uh, the last one we'll cover is the uh, Unicredit Group. Um, this is the, the big dollar winner so far this year. And uh, this is to settle, I think it's 29, yeah, roughly 2,900 uh, transactions, um, violations by German, Austrian, and Italian banks within the Unicredit Group. Um, but, you know, violating multiple sanctions programs, not just destination-based, but again, the activity-based ones like WMD proliferation, uh, you know, counterterrorism sanctions and things like that. So um, the, the idea here is that, uh, you know, the, these banks, uh, you know, knowingly processed uh, and concealed activities that they knew would be in violation of, uh, you know, of U.S. sanctions. And so in this regard, they are also in the position of a, a prevailing theme you're seeing in enforcement, which is causing someone else, particularly someone else being a U.S. person, to violate the U.S. sanctions. You see that in the Huawei allegations as well. But um, Unicredit's uh, unique approach to this was to try to have what they called an OFAC neutral uh, manner of processing these payments, which I think most people on the U.S. government side would call sanctions evasion uh, manner. But, you know, that's, um, so maintaining accounts for the you know, Irizal, which is the Iranian Islamic Republic of Iran shipping lines, uh, you know, uh, maintaining U.S. dollar denominated accounts for them. And, you know, that, that's, that's big no-no and has been for a long time. So um, 
it was determined to be an egregious case, will, willful circumvention, you know, no surprise there. But again, it's, um, you know, I think the, the main takeaway there is, you know, um, you know, foreign, foreign, particularly foreign financial institutions are going to be in the line of fire when they cause someone else to, you know, to, to, to buy unwittingly and unknowingly violate the, you know, sanctions. So with that, um, I will uh, turn it over to Nina and um, we'll get back to uh, some of the, um, you know, some of the uh, export control and sanctions issues uh, in the hypothetical. Thanks, Alan. Uh, now we turn to kind of where the rubber meets the road with people all around the world that are involved in these different types of conduct. Nina? Uh, thanks, Joe. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm so happy to be here. I have been for years meaning to come to this conference, so I couldn't be happier to share this stage with Alan and Chuck and to see all of you. And I get to talk about what I love, which is extradition. <laughs> so you ask, why would you love extradition? Who's ha handled an extradition? Okay, a couple of people. So hopefully I won't bore those few of you. Um, I'm gonna start with Interpol. Interpol is really interesting because when you look at this operating model, you can see that Interpol does a lot more than what we all think Interpol does, right? So we know Interpol as a red notice. That most people, that's about what they know. But as you can see, Interpol has a lot of different functions, and I just thought this was an interesting slide to demonstrate that. And they have a tremendous global structure. Uh, they have regional offices all over the globe. And there's a lot of different notices. So we're all familiar with the, you know, the red notice, which is basically an arrest warrant. But then there's the yellow notice, which is to locate missing persons. And the blue notice, to collect information. So that's sort of an investigatory function. I have a case right now where the client has a yellow notice and a blue notice out on them. And it's very disruptive in life to have any kind of notices from Interpol in the system on you. And you should know my practice, I basically represent individuals. I rarely represent corporations. Um, I'm mostly in this space anyway, this, this Interpol extradition space. I mostly represent individuals in the United States uh, that another country wants. So I'm fighting another country to keep my client in the United States because most times if they get extradited, things are really gonna go badly for them. So, you know, there's a black notice talking about unidentified bodies. There's a green notice, which is a warning kind of notice of criminal activities, an orange notice, another kind of warning, and a purple notice, which really uh, is, a, again, another investigatory function. The thing with Interpol is if you have a client that has one of these notices out and you want to challenge that with Interpol, it's an extremely slow process because Interpol only meets two to three times a year. So yeah, it's not like you can say to the client, no problem, I'll get right on it. You can get right on it, but getting it in front of Interpol when they've got the, these limited meeting times is obviously challenging. Okay, so this is super interesting. The abuse that continues to take place with the notice system uh, in Interpol is staggering. So you can see between 2001 and 2016, the increase in red notices. And if you look down below, you can see even the, the increase to 2017. Uh, same with yellow, blue, um, th these, these are just astounding numbers. And I can tell you from where I sit, what I'm seeing is, like I said, an increasing abuse. Uh, one example, uh, we've uh, come to understand that China is now using red notices against people who don't pay their mortgage. 
So and the problem is, is that so you don't pay your mortgage in China, and um, uh, China China is going to put out a, an arrest warrant for you, and Interpol is going to put it in the system. That's crazy. I've got a client now with a, uh, a blue notice on her kid. I'm sorry, blue notice on her and a yellow notice on her kid, which is basically the result of a child custody matter. She left the country on vacation uh, to go see her family in uh, Bolivia. And as she's uh, traveling, she gets stopped because there's a notice in the system, a blue, a yellow notice in, I'm sorry, I keep confusing. There's a blue notice in the system because her husband said that she abducted the kid because he just decided that it was a good time to get divorced. So, uh, and her kid ends up in the system, five-year-old kid, as a missing person. Again, uh, the abuse that we're seeing is, is disturbing at the least. Uh, so that's the part, I don't really like to talk about that much because it's really bad, but now let's talk about extradition, which I love. So extradition is controlled uh, in the United States by uh, 18 U.S.C. 31 at, uh, 3184 at SEC, and, but mostly it's controlled by the treaty with the foreign nation. So the best thing about extradition is that there's no rules that apply. There's no criminal procedure rules. There's no civil procedure rules. Extradition is truly, in terms of litigation, kind of like the Wild West. Hearsay comes in in a hearing. It, it's literally up to the judge to decide what he or she wants to hear or doesn't want to hear. So, in more so than in most cases, the judge you draw makes a di big difference in the kind of hearing you're going to get in, when it comes to extradition. But it's, it's the treaty that really drives the, all the litigation, and we'll talk about that in a second. Just so you know, the United States has treaties with about 122 countries. There's about 75 countries we don't have any treaty with. If there's no treaty, then the extradition process is not a mechanism that either we can use or a foreign country can use to, to get somebody into their country. I'm going to really blow through these quickly. Uh, common defenses with extradition are uh, uh, lack of probable cause, double jeopardy, political or military offense, and the statute of limitations uh, as it applies in the requesting country. So in extradition, you've got the requested country. That's the one that's getting the request, and the requesting country the one that's making the request. Across the board, in any one of these cases, you always need to have local counsel in whatever country is, uh, and again, I'm gonna use the example from my own personal example, uh, is making the request, the re requesting country. So if you're assuming the United States is the requested country because you've got a client who's in the United States and you wanna keep your client here, um, you're dealing with the requesting country and you always have to have local counsel for many reasons because while the treaty controls, you still have to interpret what it means. It's just a contract. So, you know, we all know from law school, contracts, they're, they're just the words, but they're rarely entirely clear. I mean, that's why we have judges, obviously, because even our statutes aren't entirely clear and we have judges examine and, and determine what they mean. And the same thing with treaties. So you really need to have your local counsel there so your local counsel can help you to understand the application of certain portions of, of treaties. And, and you have to look at uh, uh, similar laws in the United States. I'm gonna turn uh, to the hypo because it, it was easy for me to tie the, this discussion on extradition to the hypo. So you've got this guy, Vlad, he's the Russian national. And, um, you know, assuming that, let, let's just say, because I'm now going to embellish on the hypo, let's just say that uh, we find there's FCPA violations and uh, the government has now filed an under indictment seal, um, a, a, an indictment under seal. 
So what's going to happen to Vlad? Well, I'm going to say the United States probably put a red notice in the system. Vlad should just stay in Russia because if he leaves Russia, he can be picked up on that red notice. But if he stays in Russia, he's totally protected. So we're saying international travel is not advised for Vlad. Does he have a danger of being extradited? Well, no, he doesn't because we have no treaty with Russia. So Russia is one of those one of the 75 countries that we don't have an extradition treaty with. So Vlad, for all intents and purposes, is pretty safe. And I would probably just say, just stay there. Heinrich, on the other hand, is in a little bit of a different situation. Same rules regarding international travel apply. The way um, you know, Interpol works is uh, you know, if, you're, if you're within the confines of the country that you're in and you're not walking into any airports, um, you, you know, you're pretty safe. Uh, but if you venture out, then you're not. So, if Heinrich stays in Germany, he's going to be fine. Um, so let's talk about what happens if uh, the U.S. tries to extradite him. So all extradition is treaty-based. Anytime you've got an extradition case, the first thing you want to do is drill down and read that treaty because that's what's going to drive everything you do. Uh, the U.S.-Germany treaty had three iterations. The first was in 1978. That's pretty much the main treaty. The second one uh, was a supplement in 93. And then in 2006, based on a U.S.-EU treaty, Germany kind of modified their treaty with the U.S. So some of the concepts we talked about appear in pretty much all treaties. So. This one concept of dual criminality, uh, let me talk to you a little bit, bit about that. What that means is for an extradition to take place, you're generally going to see in any extradition treaty that the crime has to be similar in both countries. So if there was some random cr crime in Thailand, uh, I'm not sure that the U.S. would be able to extradite uh, somebody out of Thailand because there wouldn't be dual criminality. The crime has to be similar in both countries. And for the most part, crimes are similar in, simil in, in different countries. But uh, this is absolutely a concept that pretty much appears in every treaty. And it appears in this treaty between the U.S. and Germany in Articles 1 and 2. Another very common... Uh, aspect of a treaty is the political or military offense exception to extradition. So no country wants to have to extradite someone to another country when that extradition is based on political motives or purposes, right? So this is also pretty standard, doesn't apply in this hypothetical. I just wanted to point it out to you. It's a pretty standard clause in most treaties. This one is unique. This one is in the German treaty. This, has, this, whole, this article is entitled Fiscal Offenses, and it's basically a carve out for an offense described in item number 27, where Germany can say, nope, we're not giving you that person. And so when you look at article 27, and this was like gold to me as I was on the plane yesterday reading this treaty, I thought, oh my goodness, look at this Article 27, because it's a carve out that Germany does not have to extradite for offenses against the laws relating to importation, exportation, or transit of goods, articles, or merchandise. So maybe that's a defense for Heinrich in Germany. I mean, it's certainly something to run down because that, that is a basis of this hypothetical. Uh, the other thing about Germany, uh, U.S. treaty is Germans are very national centric and, and that's, that's somewhat unique to Germany. It is also somewhat for France, uh, whereas the U.K., they, they, they'll pretty much let people go all the time, most times. But like I said, every country is a little bit different. Germany really tries to protect its nationals and it's built into the treaty. And most treaties have this 
clause that you see highlighted under one. What most treaties don't have is what you see highlighted under three, which is uh, we'll agree, um, if we, if we say we're not going to extradite, we'll, we'll consider prosecuting them ourselves. That's unusual. And I think it just goes to that, that the relationship between Germany and US as codified in the treaty is really that Germany is gonna protect its people. And talking about protecting people, uh, what we were also seeing in terms of Russia is, and I can talk about this a little bit later, but I'm thinking about it now. Uh, when multiple countries want somebody, and uh, we'll get to that in a sec. What, let, me, let me come back to that. Let me go to this. So double jeopardy in most treaties. So most countries respect double jeopardy. Um, I have a case right now pending where double jeopardy is, is a huge issue. Um, that client was uh, charged simultaneously in Colombia and in the US. Uh, the US went forward first. It was a state prosecution, 155 counts. Uh, 150 of them were dismissed because of statute of limitations, which is also something you'll see in pretty much all treaties. It's the statute of limitations of the, uh, of the um, requesting Re requesting state that applies. And uh, so the client ends up getting convicted of one charge. Then Costa Rica starts its uh, extradition proceedings and whether or not uh, double jeopardy applies and whether or not the crimes are beyond the statute of limitations, of course, is a huge issue in that litigation. So when you're looking at statute of limitations, you're always interpreting the local statutes, which is of course why you need local counsel. How am I doing on time? Well, about another minute or two. What? Sorry. All right. Two, three, two, three All right. minutes. How's that sound? I'm going to think he means five. Okay. So. Okay. <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> Good negotiation. <laughs> um, okay. Probable cause. This is good. People don't, you know, people really dismiss probable cause, right? We all deal with indictments and you know, God knows they're pretty easy for the government to get. Those of you who have ever worked in state court, um, probable cause is, is can, can be, it depends on where you are, but in California we have probable cause hearings. Um, yeah, this is, this is uh, something that can really help you in defending an extradition because it is probable cause of the as applied in the requested state. So I guess I've got a case right now out of Dallas where the probable cause is so pathetic in this foreign country that this was our entire hearing, arguing that, that under US standards, there's no probable cause. And that case, that client was convicted in absentia in the foreign country. But we still get to argue whether or not the evidence establishes probable cause. The in absentia conviction is not automatically uh, able to establish probable cause. So that's just interesting. Uh, again, our friend Heinrich in Germany. This is an unusual provision in this Germany-US uh, treaty because it essentially, in my opinion, constitutes a forfeiture provision, which means if the US does move to extradite Heinrich to the United States, Germany can seize his property, basically for the United States, that's pretty nice. And they can seize all their evidence, whatever evidence that they can get their hands on. So that's just interesting. Um, Okay, I was talking before, I touched upon it, and I'm gonna come back to when there's a request for extradition by several states. Um, you can see that uh, from on the right of this slide is the 1978 Germany-US treaty. It was kind of short, uh, what happens when multiple states are requesting someone. And on the left is the 2006 
supplement. And you can see now we've got uh, different considerations that need to be uh, uh, considered by uh, the, the state as to whether or not um, who they're going to give the person to. And I bring this up because, again, this is what I was alluding to before. So Russia uh, is now, when multiple countries want someone that is their, one of their nationals that is not within the confines of their country, they will just go ahead and file charges against that person. And by doing that, they're going to get priority under this consideration under what is Article 5 of the uh, EU extradition agreement, which means that person is not going to get prosecuted somewhere else. That person is going to get back to Russia, and then whatever Russia does with that person is up to them. But I frankly wouldn't be surprised if those charges went away many times. So out of respect for my time, I'm going to stop here and uh, turn it back over to Joe. So I'm um, so sorry, Nina, for abridging your presentation a little bit, but it's, there's not enough time. We, we have lunch coming up in a few minutes. Uh, what I thought I might do is, is turn to the uh, hypothetical that we had. And um, the so, because so much of this is so exciting, really, to me, the, in terms of the export control piece, it's, uh, you see increased enforcement, increased pursuit of you know, U.S. nationals around the world. Uh, foreign nationals as part of this. But Alan, in terms of the, the export control laws and this hypothetical, or can you give us sort of a brief look at what those laws might be that have been violated? Yeah, well, the first, the first place to start with any export control issue is export control jurisdiction classification. Who controls it and how is it controlled? Because without that information, you really can't, uh, can't determine it. So the first thing I look at here is, um, you know, if it's crude oil, that's generally EAR 99 doesn't really require, you know, export licensing to anywhere other than embargo destinations and then a couple of unique carve outs. But if it's a specialty petroleum product, which we have an indication that it could be, you know, uh, you know, for you know, high performance machinery and uh, jet engines and things like that, then it may be subject to uh, short supply controls under the uh, commerce uh, regime, the export administration regulations. So that'd be the threshold uh, question. And then what we do have uh, indications that we have our, our Savannah plant manager departed amid rumors that oil was making, you know, the product was making its way to Iran via the UAE. So we have a diversion red flag that cannot be ignored there. Um, and what that would mean for the company is that, you know, is that there's a, there are a set of general prohibitions at part 736 of the export administration regulations that um, that is, is kind of a checklist. It's a before it goes out the door. If you're a pilot, your knee board or something like that. That uh, to, you know, and, and one the last one on that list is you cannot proceed with a transaction if you you know know or, or you know reasonably know that there's a, a likelihood that a violation is going to occur. So uh, the transshipment red flag would have to be dealt with you know prior to any other uh, any other shipments, and then you have your um, your in use, in user controls at, uh, at one part of the EAR, and then there's some embargo controls there as well. And then the last thing I'll say on the uh, export control side is the, you know, I mentioned at the very outset of my presentation about the effort to determine what is an emerging technology and the ANPRM that you're going to be seeing soon on determining what is a foundational technology. A lot of the petroleum related products are I'll say a lot, uh, they're going to be looked at for foundational technologies. And so some of the things that are, are subject to short supply controls will likely be in that. So that's a bit more of an extension. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously we don't have the facts to support that here, but that's one other thing. Um, and then so that's that's the export control side. I'll hit the, the sanctions piece here quickly. Um, you got two major, actually the two most complicated sanctions regimes that the U.S. system has, I would argue, are both implicated here, Russia and Iran. Um, first of all, you know, the, the, the Ukraine-related Russia sanctions, um, are it, it, the reason it's so difficult to get your hands around it if you've ever had to deal with it is because the sectoral sanctions program, which came out in 2014, which there hadn't been a sectoral sanctions program before that, and a lot of folks will refer to that as the for those of you of the age and Animal House fans, double-seeker probation 
you know, we don't want to make everybody especially designated national because we know there is still commerce that has to go on between the U.S. and Russia. So this sectoral sanctions program comes into effect where we can target particular sectors of an economy, such as in Russia's case, defense, uh, energy, um, uh, financial services, and then another, um, you know, specific sector on uh, uh, deep water offshore petroleum uh, exploration. So you would have to look at, um, you know, here we are clearly within the energy sector. So it is a, you know, a sector that you would want to drill down on the specific conduct to see if it triggers anything within that sanctions regime. And I would say the, the most potentially problematic aspect is that we're, you know, we know that we have Russian ownership. And so that always calls into question, okay, so who is that? All the way up the, the corporate line and block chart, back to our, remember the OFAC 50% rule and the difficulty of doing that, particularly in Russia um, or in places where, you know, you know, the comfort level of taking you up the corporate chain is expires at a certain level and nobody wants to go beyond that. So for Russia transactions that we deal with now, I mean, you've got to say, so what oligarch is this tied to, you know, and, uh, and, and, and run it up the chain that way. So that's, that would be the concern because, um, if, you know, if we have somebody who's designated as an especially designated national or even is on the uh, sectoral sanctions identification list, which again is the double secret probation list, uh, you know, uh, somewhat like an SDN, but basically has a prohibition on U.S. persons doing, uh, doing business with them, then we have to know it. And we also have to know if that 50% rule comes into play. So that would be the, uh, the issue there. And the extension is also on the BIS entity list that, you know, you've heard talk about you know Huawei and their affiliates being on so that would be triggered and then the other aspect of the Russia sanctions is I mentioned the sectoral sanctions for 2014 and 2017 a very broad law CATSA which you may be familiar with had an effect on many sanctions programs um, and you know uh, primarily on Russia um, which created a secondary sanctions uh, provision for significant transactions that are, um, you know, that are performed with sanctioned Russian parties. So we could be in the, in right. the zone of, of, of Alan, doing I, that. I, I'm going to abridge you a little bit, if you don't mind, if I okay. could do that. And I apologize, because uh, we're running close. Uh, but uh, what I thought I'd do, just maybe jump the chuck and then back to Nina again, if you don't mind. I know you were gonna touch on Iranian, the Iranian piece next. Right. And uh, is there, can you give that a quick, quick uh, touch? Yeah, I mean, the transshipment uh, to Iran, I mean, it, it really is just, you know, uh, that's what you would have to drill down on. It's the same, it's the same conduct, and because th that would be a violation. Our, our UAE parent uh, would be directly in the line of fire of uh, secondary sanctions uh, okay. in the Iran program if they're doing that. Uh, Chuck, I'm not going to bother you with all the, the you know, the, di the, di the diagram questions here on the, but any thoughts on this uh, equation, the things you see? And then I want to go back to Nina on extradition. Sure. The, the short version is, if you look at the fourth bullet point under conduct and backdrop, um, you, you look, is that a bribe scheme? Yeah, it's a bribe scheme. So anything of value you know, to a foreign official in return for an official act in order to obtain or retain business. I think bullet point four makes that part easy but where everybody in this room is gonna make their money and their clients are gonna care about what you're gonna to have to say, say to them is, so maybe a bribe was paid to some UAE officials, does that mean it's an FCPA violation? And that is where you sort of get into the weeds. And so the first thing I would do is I would say, well, who are the actors and what buckets do they fall into? Right now, the, the, the bullet point doesn't actually tell us who's paying the bribe, so let's keep that aside just for a moment. So who are the companies that we're dealing with? Remember how I was saying there's sort of, there's U.S. companies, well, there are U.S. issuers and foreign issuers, so you're publicly traded in the United States. Domestic concerns, which means U.S. companies, U.S. citizens, uh, nationals, and resident aliens. And then your third bucket is DD3, and those are foreign nationals and foreign non-publicly traded companies. So where do these companies fall in, right? So the parent company in, in UAE does not appear to be uh, the, the parent company, at least, does not appear to be publicly traded. The U.S. company is. So the first thing you say to yourself is, okay, UAE company, what is that? It's DD3. It's a foreign, non-publicly traded company. Whew. That's the hardest uh, category to establish jurisdiction on. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that conduct, 
uh, according to the United States Congress, in order to be able to have jurisdiction for an FCPA violation over a foreign non-publicly traded company, is that the conduct in furtherance of the crime must occur, at least in part, while in the territory of the United States. Not just sort of moving through a, a SWIFT account, our correspondent account, DOJ and SEC, SEC, well actually SEC has nothing to do with this, DOJ won't interpret it that way. I don't think they will. I don't think there's, there's never been tried before, uh, but, uh, but it's while in the territory, physical presence, physical presence. You don't have that, at least not on this fact pattern. Um, and then you look at the, the, the U.S. company and say, okay, well, what's going on with the U.S. company? So it's a publicly traded company in the United States, so that's DD1, uh, so that's U.S. issuer. Uh, jurisdiction, um, you know, you're kind of screwed. Uh, you know, as as I didn't say shit. Um, uh, Six. In the uh, because uh, because uh, at the end of the day, there needs to be a, a means or instrumentality of interstate or foreign commerce, um, which is U.S. nexus. But if you're that applies uh, to the the foreign issuers. But for U.S. issuers, it actually says there's alternative jurisdiction that was added in '98, and that says. Anywhere in the world, uh, if this happens in violation, there's jurisdiction for it. So, so if the U.S. company is involved, then you could have jurisdiction over this. And so you then need to really dig into the facts mm -hmm. and figure out, well, who done it? Um, right. And the last thing I'll leave you with is it got a lot more complicated for the Department of Justice because you know, if, if the UAE company did it um, and, they, and there are people back in the U.S. that knew about it, uh, and they want to be able to reach the UAE company and charge them with conspiring to violate it um, uh, because they're actually coordinating with the, uh, the DD-1 U.S. issuer. The Hoskins case blew that up and said you can't just charge a, DD a DD-3 person while in the territory person that you couldn't charge directly with a substance of offense for conspiring to violate a statute that there's no underlying substance of offense for. So that's the Hoskins case right there. Uh, and so you can't charge conspiracy. So what DOJ would try to do in this circumstance is they would try to say that UAE, the UAE parent, was acting as an agent of the U.S. issuer. And that is about what's to take place in Connecticut in district court with uh, Hoskins, who is a foreign national, he's a UK citizen working for, formerly for Alstom, uh, and was uh, supposedly conspiring with some folks in, in, uh, in Connecticut. And, and the problem is that they have to establish that he's an agent. And it's interesting because they're moving up the food chain and the corporate ladder. Uh, principal agent normally goes the other direction. So difficult jurisdictional case, I think. Very, very interesting analysis. and, and um all of this is uh, bleeding us to 12 o'clock, thereabouts. And I want to, but I, as Nina, as, as you think about this in terms of the clients coming to you, you get client, a lot of clients are US, US in the United States, correct? And they come to you and they want your services because they've been there, somebody's trying to extradite a country around the world. Uh, do, do, who do you collaborate with? Who are, how do you build your team to, to represent these people? Do you work with the Department of Justice, Department of State on occasion? Uh, is this, or am I, am I off base based on how you might build your defenses? I'm usually fighting with the Department of Justice. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, my team is uh, local counsel, local investigator, and you know, my team here are in Beverly Hills. Um, yeah, you know, the Department of Justice, you know, I had a case where the Department of Justice dismissed an extradition request because I was able to demonstrate it was a politically motivated request. Um, I've got a case right now where I was just telling you where the probable cause is pathetic. And uh, I, I basically said to the Department of Justice, you have an obligation to your citizens before you have an obligation to uh, Columbia and, and to extradite this citizen based on this garbage is wrong. And I was met with, we can't hear you. So, you know, uh, no, I fight with the Department of Justice generally. So I try to collaborate, but uh, that doesn't always work. As, as, as we think, as we wrap up, uh, final thoughts on your, your role, Nina, and your discrete role dealing with these issues. Any final thoughts on it that you've observed from your years of doing it that mm. you share with the audience that might be useful? Uh, yeah, just, yeah, it, it really, it, the treaty controls, uh, you gotta have people on the ground in the foreign country, um, a lawyer and an investigator. I think those are the most important, you know, an expert. Um, we brought in experts, uh, academics that are specialists 
in certain countries' laws. There's a lot of interpretation that goes on, and it's a really fine line because there's this rule of non-inquiry that also applies uh, globally with respect to extradition, which means that no one country should be looking at another country's laws because you're not supposed to inquire. But again, it's the Wild West, so you kind of have to sometimes. And, and uh, one thing, just a yes. quick thing. So when uh, Nina was talking, she talked about dual criminality, and that is absolutely key because you're saying some crazy law in Thailand. What about the FCPA, right? <laughs> That, that's a law that until 1999 was the only law in the world that actually prohibited foreign bribery. So there's a guy, and I just want to show everybody this. This is Victor Kazani. Uh, he's standing uh, in the water in the Bahamas, uh, which is where he continues to live, uh, hopefully for him, uh, given recent events. But um, uh, so he's in the Bahamas, standing there getting his picture taken because the U.S. was unable to extradite him because the Bahamas does not have the FCPA or its functional equivalent. They don't have a foreign bribery law. So Victor Kazani continues to live in the Bahamas. The US was unable to get him because of dual criminality. And incidentally, his nickname was the Pirate of Prague. So you can only imagine what the crimes might have been. We can talk about that later. Excellent. That's, that's a happy uh, story. <laughs> so we, we worked in Dorian and the Bahamas and, uh, and FCPA and all one thing. So uh, Alan, any, any final thoughts from you? I, at this, what this brings up is that this uh, this panel could have been you know a day long panel. And uh, but any thoughts, closing thoughts on on your discipline? I would say for practitioners, the thing to keep your eye on is the evolution that I began talking about. You know the the implementation of FIRMA, the changes to CFIUS, trying to stem the tide of uh, technology transfers by acquisition, education, or espionage in the U.S. And then the export control regimes that are going to be you know put in place including on some things that haven't been controlled before to try to stem the tide of, uh, you know, of uh, export, you know, of, of technology bleed overseas. And just remember that, yes, it's motivated by China, but it's globally applicable. So I think keep your eye on that and, uh, you know, and, uh, that would be the most important. China topic. probably wants lots of Americans uh, to China. <laughs> Well, hopefully, uh, we have one Chinese person we're holding, right, with Huawei. Let me ask um, Chuck, thoughts uh, here at the end, and you can work in the S word if you want to. <laughs> I, 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 I won't. Although my firm's nickname is MoFo, so you had to expect. Yeah, right. You had right. to expect, you know. Uh, no, look, I think FCPA enforcement is going to continue uh, aggressively. Um, there's a switch in leadership um, at the DOJ. Uh, the new head, for those of you who don't follow the space that closely, is Chris Estero. He's a, a career guy, been there for a long time. Um, I don't think anything's changing. Uh, the way I always look at it is look at the resources. So when I was there, we had about 15 prosecutors. They're now at least 30. Uh, they have uh, uh, paralegals, uh, at least 15 paralegals uh, that all speak foreign languages. Uh, there are, I think, three F uh, FBI, FCPA squads now um, uh, that uh, are, are working on cases. When I was there, we had half of a squad. Uh, so you look at the resources. I think these cases will continue for quite some time. Now, these cases will happen here in Atlanta, and they'll happen yeah. all throughout uh, the United States. Uh, FCPA, the export control cases, and obviously the extradition of U.S. citizens, uh, the attempt to extradite them. So these are all three topics that we could only, the appropriate word in the title was glimpse. We could only give you a glimpse at them. I hope our three panelists will be able to stay with us for lunch and be able to answer any individual questions you might have. But a lot of work went into this panel, so if you don't mind, let's give them a great round of applause. Thank you, thanks so much.